Take delight in love at first sight. You can taste the kiss of love as it grows. But the sweetest kiss can be gone quick as it, and not even leave a trace as it goes. It's better to take delight. Desires of your heart. Cause you can take the light in diamonds so bright. You can go after gold with all of its worth. But one day you will find that you leave it behind. Cause you go and you die as you came at your birth. It's always better to take the light. Guys awake now? <laughs> Hi, Anna. Hi. How are Hi. you this morning, Frank? I'm okay. Very good. Yeah. Good to see everybody this morning. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I was. You were taking delight. I know. I was taking delight. I love that song. I know Frank that uh, has been with you a long time, but we appreciate that you <laughs> yeah. bring it out and dust it off for oh, us. We love that. Okay. We love it, and it's always a good <laughs> reminder. <laughs> good reminder. Glad to have you here with us this morning. It's it's a good morning. It is a beautiful morning. Uh, the sun is shining, and most important, we are together in God's house. It's a it's a great time to be together to worship Him. Uh, just a couple of words of announcement. You guys uh, pretty well know, but you want to make sure you get a program. They're back at the front door and around the corner at the well. Welcome Center, so you can follow along. The scriptures for today are in there, um, so you can take notes as we go through the uh, the message and have something to study on this week. Also inside your program, there is uh, the Connect card. You want to fill that out so you can drop it in the offering bag a little later with ways we can connect with you. And if you have any specific questions, or the most popular section is the prayer requests and praises. We love being able to pray with you, join with you in the things that are on your heart, but also the things that you're praising God for that he's done in your life. So if you want to fill that out, feel free to do so, and uh, we'll have, be able to share that at time of offering. Uh, right now, we're going to get back to worship, because I hear Frank is playing his guitar, and he's ready to sing. It's always good to praise and worship God. And even when you're singing. But he wants us to praise and worship him. 
with our very lives. And we have to ask him sometimes for the power to do that when we try and do it on our own. It doesn't quite work as well. So we want to rise and have his spirit lead us in our worship. and our praise to rise to you. Uh, and sometimes the way that we can do that best is by, well, uh, have you ever seen little kids worship? Have you ever seen little children offer up worship and praise? Kind of get excited. They kind of do things a little differently. And, and so we thought we'd bring that, a little bit of that here this morning to us <coughs> more mature types. Okay? <laughs> now, uh, Katie... You work with kids, yes, you do. and you love working with kids. So much fun. Make sure her vo make sure her mic is up there, Cody. Okay, uh, because we're uh, she's going to lead us in a little bit of a kid type version of a song <laughs> that we do. Uh, this um, you know the song you know love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. There's a kid version. Okay, how many of you know the kid version? 
<laughs> Pete, way in the back. You know, I'm not going to call you up to demonstrate, okay? You can stay back there. That's fine. Um, but it, it's, Katie's going to demonstrate it, and then we're going to sing it a couple times, okay? So we're going to do it a few times. And, and then we'll go into the adult version. Uh, but we're going to intersperse the kid version along with the adult version. So be ready. Pay attention. Put on your kid, you know, face. All right? Get your kid, I don't know, mojo or whatever. Get your kid <laughs> thing going. All right? Put on your listening Let's have ears. a little, yeah, put on your listening ears. Is that what yes. you tell them? Yes. Okay. She's going to instruct us, so this is scary. Okay. Are you guys ready? Again, again. 
you, Rudy. <laughs> now, wasn't that fun to kind of get your inner child out? Wasn't that fun? Yeah. Me too. I, uh, I enjoy kind of drawing out that inner child every once in a while. It's kind of fun. Um, I, some people I say do it way too often. Often? Okay. Well, um, as much fun as that is, there is a seriousness to that whole idea of loving the Lord with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and loving your neighbor as yourself, and, and offering that up to God every single day. Uh, and it fits in with the series that we've been talking about all these weeks, which is basically following God and following Him no matter what, right? No matter what.
What would I have left behind? What if God's trying to tell me something? <laughs> like what? Get more exercise? I gotta stop doing this. That's what you always say. And what would Matthew do? Here's what we read. Matthew got up and followed him. Hey there. I got a little something for you. How about a big red juicy apple? How about that? Jesus draws attention to the fact that this man loved comfort more than following him. Jesus puts this man at a crossroads and he says you can pursue comfort or you can pursue me but you can't pursue both. actually an answered prayer. I asked for a new heart. If you haven't been participating in the small group study that goes along with this series we've been doing entitled Not a Fan, the main character that you see in those videos is uh, named Eric. Eric is going through a, a process in his life as we watched through these videos over the last six weeks, a process of moving from being a fan of God, a fan of Jesus, to becoming a follower. He had a wake-up call that took place in his life. He had a heart attack, found himself in the hospital, and it wasn't time for him to leave this life. He came out of that hospital heart attack experience saying... There's got to be more to this life than what I've been pursuing. What do I need to do? What does God want me to do? And it's probably more than just exercising more. As he went on his journey and we tracked his journey <clears throat> over the past six weeks, what we saw was Eric moving from fan to follower and the effect that it had on all of the people around him. And today, this week, as we draw this series to a close, I'm going to start asking you the question that you probably did not want me to ask at all. Are you content with being a fan? Or are you ready to become a follower? It became very clear as we went through this study that it, it wasn't an instantaneous kind of a thing. That even for Eric, when he came out of the hospital and he uh, was touched by a homeless uh, mother and daughter, that he wanted to change things in his life, but those changes took place over the course of three, four, five years. And as those changes took place, it affected all of the people around him as well. It wasn't an easy process. It wasn't a, a straightforward flip of a switch, and suddenly he is a, a follower of Jesus. Remember, he went to church before this. He attended services with his wife. If he wasn't, you know, in jail for a DUI. He certainly would, you know, sing the worship songs and participate at the right times. He had plenty of scriptures memorized because his father would beat them into him as he was being raised. He had a lot of it that he already knew. But he was so frustrated as a, as a young man because he knew that there was something missing in what he had learned when he was growing up. He became a follower. Today, I, I'm asking you that question. Are you ready to become a follower? 
Are you ready to make the transition? Are you ready to allow God to change your life? We uh, looked at passages of people that Jesus called to follow him. <clears throat> Peter, for example, Jesus was walking beside the Sea of Galilee. He saw two brothers, Simon Peter and his brother Andrew. They were casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Come follow me, Jesus said, and I will send you out to fish for men or for people. And at once they left their nets and they followed him. Matthew, the tax collector, which we've spoken about over the past uh, six weeks. Jesus went on from there. He saw a man named Matthew sitting at the tax collector's booth. Follow me, he told him. And Matthew got up and followed him. If Jesus came to you in your workplace, if he came walking up to you when you were in the middle of a family function, birthday, Christmas, celebrating an anniversary, if he came to you when you were in the middle of doing something that was important in your life, critical even, you were studying for your next test, you were, you were getting ready for finals, you were going into that scheduled appointment that you've been trying to get for months now. If he walked up to you right then, at that moment, and he said, it's time, follow me, what would you do? Would you drop everything and go follow him? Like Peter and Andrew? Like Matthew, as he left his job, his desk. A teacher of the law came to him and said, Teacher, I will follow you wherever you go. Jesus said, Foxes have dens and birds have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. If you're following me because you think you're going to get money out of this, you're following the wrong guy. If you're following me because you think you're going to get power and position... I'm homeless. There's not much stature to that. Another disciple came to him and said, Lord, I'll follow you, but first let me go and bury my father. And Jesus said to him, follow me and let the dead bury their own dead. Don't wait till your father retires. Don't wait until he finally passes away. And you don't need to take care of him anymore to follow me. Follow me now. Today. And then he got into his boat and his disciples followed him. We remember this story of another man who came up to Jesus and said, Teacher, what good thing must I do to get eternal life? Why do you ask me about what is good? Jesus replied, there's only one who is good. If you want to enter life... Keep the commandments. Which ones, he asked. And Jesus replied, well, you shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony. Honor your father and mother. And love your neighbor as yourself. The young man, you can almost see the pride welling up inside of him. All, all these I have kept, he said. What do I still lack? And Jesus said, well, if you want to be perfect... Go sell your possessions, give to the poor, and you will have the treasure in heaven. And then, come follow me. When the young man heard this, he went away sad because he had great wealth. When we track the story of Eric through the course of the past six weeks, one thing that we watched him do one thing that we watched him struggle through, one thing that we watched him figure out in his own life was this process of letting go of the things that stop him from following Jesus. It's not just true of a fictional character in a video that we watch. It wasn't just true of Peter and Andrew and Matthew and the other disciples it wasn't just true of the Pharisee or the rich young ruler that came and talked to Jesus. It's true for every single one of us. There are, there are things that try to stop us 
from following Him. Things that get in the way of our truly dedicating ourselves to Him. Things that we want to hold on to. Things that are important to us. Maybe wealth is something that is important to you and you pursue. And so that's something that gets into your, in your way, like the rich young ruler. But maybe for you, you say, no, money doesn't bother me at all. But uh, companionship, now, now, you know, God doesn't want me to be alone, does he? And so you'll do anything to have a companion in life, even going against what God says is a good, healthy relationship for companions, for partners, even for friends. Maybe that doesn't get to you at all either. Maybe the issue is, is pride. You, you want to feel good about yourself, and the only way you've ever learned to feel good about yourself is by knocking down other people. I'm better than. It could be as subtle as reading a, a, a newspaper and reading for the, looking for those articles where something is going wrong with somebody else. Somebody does something that's terrible or horrific in your mind. And somehow you find a, a, a sense of, um, well... Comfort in knowing at least I'm not like him or her or them. You, you find a, you know that pride is not good, but you, you feel good about yourself because you can look down on somebody else. Maybe you have problems looking someone who is homeless in the eye. You struggle with giving money or food to someone who doesn't have food to eat. Maybe you have a problem forgiving. And even though you know that forgiveness is only necessary when somebody sins against you, and forgiveness has nothing to do with whether they deserve it or not, you're just not going to let go. Because you're mad. And you don't want to let them off the hook. I don't know what it is that gets in the way of your following Jesus. The list could go on and on and on. But in the end, none of us can be followers until we do let go. We let go of the anger. We let go of the fear. We let go of the greed and the pride we let go of those things that keep us away from Him and truly being His disciples. Because He said, if you love Me, you will obey My commands. And so, the first thing that you need to do to be a follower is let go of what stops you. Hey, speaking of letting go of things that stop you, I don't want anything to get in the way of you feeling comfortable here and getting to know folks and, and being the body of Christ. And so I want you to do is uh, let go of any fear of saying hi to somebody that you might have right now. Go ahead and get up, find someone, welcome them, tell them I'm really glad that you're here today and that we get to worship together. Would you please do that right now? Three years ago, you became a bleeding heart. And ever since, we've been bleeding money. Now you do this, or you clean out your office. I don't need anything in my office.
Just tell me. Tell me this is not easy for you. This is the most difficult thing I've ever done. And I need to know that you and the kids are with me. I realize that I haven't been a good son to you for a long time. I was often ungrateful, and I took you for granted. But I hope you see that I've changed. That day I went to the hospital, that was, a, it was the greatest day of my life. Because I knew God had forgiven me. And he was asking me to follow him and really live. I hope that you'll forgive me for all those years. Will you at least try? Yeah. I love you, Dad. Following Jesus can create difficulty in the closest relationships you have in your life. In Eric's case, he found himself not willing to do unethical things, and because of it, he lost his job. When he lost his job, it created great tension with his wife, with his kids. It created tension with his father, who had trained him to be a good businessman. And he found himself having to work through the changes in those relationships and trying desperately to hold on to them as he became a follower of Jesus. We've, we read passages that were difficult like this one, where Jesus says, anyone who loves their father and mother more than me is not worthy of me. Anyone who loves their son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. Whoever does not take up their cross and follow me is not worthy of me. And whoever find, finds their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for my sake will find it. These are, these are tough things, tough, tough uh, concepts to, to wrap our minds around. Especially when we think that God is, is, um, is trying to make everything comfortable for us. God never promises to make everything comfortable for you. What he does promise is to work everything together for your good if you love him and you are called according to his purpose. He will work those things together for your good, but that does not mean the process is going to be comfortable or easy. That's why Jesus says you will need to take up your cross to follow me. I've used this example before, and if you've been around me, you've seen this example, but I'll just do a little, point out a, a specific piece of it. Most of the time in relationships, what we do is we build relationships with people that have things in common with us. We look for people that you know, like the same baseball teams or football teams, or they care about sports, or they, they care about... You know, I'm a nerd, so I, I find people who are nerds like me, and we can talk computer tech stuff or whatever. We, we, we look for people that uh, have those things in common, and then we build 
closer relationships with them. They become our friends. Those are the ones we, we find it easy to talk to because we kind of speak the same language, if you will. And, and we, we think about and, and spend our days on the same kinds of things. I tell couples when they're getting together that uh, oftentimes a, a married couple, what they do is, is uh, we try to build our relationship by, by getting on the same page on many areas of our life. And the way we do it with another person is we say, you need to come over to me where I am on this particular topic. Or they say to us, no, 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 you come over to me on this particular topic or area of life. And then what ends up happening is if neither of us are willing to budge, if neither of us are willing to move, then we have a problem in our relationship. Something's driving a wedge between the two of us. No, 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 you need to come over to my perspective. No, you need to come over to my perspective. Now what our society will tell us to do is to, to, to learn to be okay with having different perspectives and leave that gap in your relationship between one another. But that's not what God tells us to do. You see, what God explains, the way He does the picture, is simply this. Imagine that this chair right here represents God. And I'm going to take the chair and put it in the middle of the room. What God says is, draw near to me and I will draw near to you. Jesus says, follow me. I will make you fishers of men. I will work all things together for your good. I will teach you to love not only God with your whole heart, mind, soul, and strength, but to love your neighbor as yourself. And so, what he calls all of us to do is to move. None of us get to stay still. None of us get to stay in our comfort zones. We all have to take steps toward the chair. But what ends up happening is as we draw closer to him, as we take the steps to the chair, it doesn't matter what perspective you originally came from. It doesn't matter what angle you are coming from on the spokes of the wheel. As I get closer to the chair and you get closer to the chair, we get closer to one another. We become a community. We become His body. We become a reflection of God's design and His picture for our lives. Now I'm going to go back to the passage that I just read. Here's where the problem comes in. When you decide to be a follower, you've made the decision to start walking toward the chair. And if your husband or wife does not start walking toward the chair also? That's going to put a gap in your relationship. That's going to start creating more issues that you have to figure out how to work through uh, in love with them. If you decide to become a follower and start moving toward the chair and your father or mother is not moving toward the chair, it will put a gap in the relationship. Your children are not walking toward the chair. It will start to put a strain on that relationship. And what Jesus said was, well, if that's the case, then just go ahead and back up and wait until your parents get caught up with you. If that's the case, then, then, then just go ahead and, and, and back up and wait for your spouse. If that's the case, then, then just, just wait. Just go ahead and stop. You don't need to come over to me. Just, just go ahead and wait and, and, until your friends and family are, are, are all moving in the same direction. Right? No. What he said was, Anyone who does not love me more than father, mother, brother, sister, anyone else in their life is not worthy to be called my disciple. 
And folks, disciple means follower. Is he saying, beat up on your parents or your kids or your spouse? Absolutely not. Because he commands us that we should be loving our neighbor as ourselves, every person in our life. But you cannot allow any relationship, any scenario in your life to get in the way of being a follower of Him, first and foremost. Because while it is equally important for us to love our neighbor as ourselves, the first command is to love the Lord our God with all our heart, with all our mind, with all of our soul, and all of our strength. When Jesus was praying in private, And his disciples were with him. He asked them, who do the crowds say that I am? They replied, well, some say John the Baptist, others Elijah, still others. uh, One of the prophets long ago that have come back to life. And he said, well, what about you? Who do you say that I am? Peter, in his normal style, jumped right on in there. There's 12 of them around, right? You know, Peter always seems to speak up. My name's sake, you got to love Peter. You are God's Messiah, he said. And then Jesus strictly warned them not to tell this to anyone, at least not yet. And he said, the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, the teachers of the law. And he must be killed and on the third day raised to life. And then he said to them all, whoever wants to be my follower, my disciple, must deny themselves, take up their cross daily and follow me. Why do we follow Jesus? Because He is the Messiah, the Christ, the Chosen One that God had predicted for thousands of years. In another place, He said, My sheep listen to My voice. I know them and they follow Me. I give them eternal life and they shall never perish. No one will snatch them out of My hand. My Father who has given them to Me is greater than all. No one can snatch them out of my Father's hand, and I and the Father are one. Why do we follow Jesus? He's not only the Messiah, but the Son of God and God Himself. We follow Him because we love the Lord our God with all our heart, with all of our mind, with all of our soul. And with all of our strength. No one and nothing can ever be more important than Him. Once you let go of the things that are getting in the way of that, once you let go of the things that are holding you back from moving toward the chair, your next step is to start taking steps toward Him. Follow Him. Move from fan to follower. It really is that simple. Well, it's that simple to describe, maybe not that simple to do. Yes, there will be issues. Yes, there will be things that try to get in the way. Yes, there will be, um, there will be challenges along the way. But with Him and through Him, the wisdom and the power that He provides, anything that you face, He will provide an answer. Any temptation that comes your way, He will provide an escape. Anything that you need to follow Him, He will and He promises to provide. And so you let go of the things that get in the way, and you follow Him. Right now we're going to give you an opportunity to follow Him in participating um, with this ministry financially. If you so desire to do that, If God has led you to do that, then this would be the time, our time of offering. As I say every week, you never need to feel pressured to give financially, not to this ministry, to any ministry, because God is the one who's going to convict your heart. God is the one who's going to lead you to participate, to give, to use what it is He's entrusted into your care for His purposes and His kingdom. But if you would like to, you can participate now in that way. 
What I always encourage everybody to do is to take that connect card that you filled out, fold that up and put it in the offering bag as it comes around. Especially if you put a prayer request on there. Know that those prayer requests that you're writing down are being prayed for starting this afternoon and continuing on throughout the rest of the week. Let's go ahead and give our gifts at this time. Lord, I'm scared. I want to see how much Natalie's grown. I realize I wasted so much time. She's already in college. There's so much she needs to know, and I don't know if I can teach her. I've asked her to volunteer at the center. I'm desperately hoping she will. I want to come back. No. Look, I won't complain anymore. It's not about that. I get frustrated and complain sometimes too, Nat. Well, then why can't I come back? Why do you want to come back? Because this is what we're supposed to do, right? I mean, we decide that we want to follow Jesus. We, we sell all of our stuff. We quit our good jobs. We sell our homes. I mean, it stinks, but we suck it up and we do it anyway, right? I mean, this is what we're supposed to do, isn't it? That's what I'm supposed to do. I don't want people to say that I'm fake. Nat, it's not how much we give. It's not how much we do. You know what separates the real from the fakes? Love. Lord Jesus, come hold me. Because I know that without you, I can do nothing. And I know that without love, I am nothing. And without love, it doesn't matter what I say. It doesn't matter how much faith I have. It doesn't matter how much I give. The only way I can be anything is if I am yours. And the only way people will know that I am yours is if I love. And that was my father. It still is. decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back, no turning back. When we started the series and we got the books and the journals, we also had available these, these, uh, these wristbands. They're just a little rubber wristband that says, uh, not a fan. And they're still, we still have some over at the Welcome Center. And if you haven't gotten them, I encourage you to get one for two reasons. The, the first is that it's going to bring up conversations with people who see it on your, on your wrist. They're, they're going to they're gonna say, not a fan, what does that mean? And it gives you the opportunity to say, well, I'm not a fan of Jesus. I'm a follower. And we learned that that's different. And so I'm becoming a follower, not a fan. But I want you to get it for another reason as well whether it brings up another conversation with another person or not, I want you to get it as a reminder to yourself. And to remember as you look at that, I'm not a fan, I'm a follower. And the very next thing that I want you to remember, followers love. Always 
everywhere, all circumstances. Followers love. They love God. They love people. Because those are human beings made in the image of God. And every time you look at that wristband, I wanted to remind you as you're having that difficult conversation with somebody, I, I, I wanted to remind you when you're having that talk with your boss and, and you really just want to let him have it. I wanted to remind you when you're ready to pull your hair out with your kids because now they're teenagers or teenagers, you want to pull their hair out because of your parents and they just don't understand. I wanted to remind you that you are not called to be a fan that sits on the sideline and praises and holds up signs that you are called to be the player on the field, a true follower. And true followers always, always live a life of love. Greater love hath no one than this, Jesus said, than to lay down one's life for one's friends. In your relationships with one another, Paul wrote to the Philippians, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who, being the very nature of God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage, but rather he made himself nothing, taking on the very nature of a servant, and being made in human likeness. And being found in the appearance of a man, he humbled himself by being obedient to death, even death on a cross. No one has gone to heaven except for the one who came from heaven, the Son of Man. And just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that everyone who believes may have eternal life in him. For God so loved the world that He gave His one and only Son, that whoever believes in Him shall not perish, but have eternal life. As you take communion today, bread will come around, reminding you of His body that was broken. Little cups will be there, reminding you of His blood that was poured out. And as you take it today, I encourage you to take it as a follower, as His disciple. Take it proclaiming for yourself, I am going to love as He loved. I'm going to lay down my life for those around me just as He did for me. I am going to be the man, the woman that God has called me to be. No excuses and no turning back. Let's take communion now.
pray with me? Father, as we get ready to leave here today, we ask you to fill our minds and our hearts with the power of your Spirit. We ask you to lead us through the wisdom, your wisdom, that you provide through your Spirit. We ask you to remind us to draw near to you and to follow you. And in the places where we have not before, we thank you for your grace, for laying down your life for us, so that we will not take on the wages of sin, which is death, but instead we have new life through you. Be our Lord. And we will follow you. We pray all of this through Jesus. Amen. You guys ready to follow? Are you sure? The Life Bridge version of I Will Follow decided as you get ready to leave out of here this is not a somber thing this is a joyous thing guys ready
guys make it a great week. God bless you.